Welcome to Wisdom Trek with Grams. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, and we are on day 2,169 of our trek. The purpose of Wisdom Trek is to create a legacy of wisdom, to seek out discernment and insights, and to boldly grow where few have chosen to grow before. Today we continue our extended series of messages that I have delivered at Putnam Congregational Church over the past couple of years. This message is week 33 on a 43-week series about the good news according to John the Apostle. John has a unique style and narrative as we walk with him through the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. I pray that it will be a conduit of learning and encouragement for you. We do appreciate you being here as we continue our series on the good news according to John the Apostle. Last week we learned or saw how Jesus warned the disciples of the coming persecution and we based our study that we understand that our lives should display the fruit of the Spirit, whether we're in good times, where we have times of peace and freedom, or we have times of persecution. Persecution to us in the United States is somewhat a foreign concept, and we just pray that it might stay that way. But if we ever do have times of persecution as believers, may the fruit of the Spirit be abundant in our hearts. Because in John chapter 16, verse 1, last week we read, All this I have told you, so that you will not fall fall away. Now our scripture today is John chapter 16, verses 5 through 15, and it's starting on page 1678 in your pew Bible. And Jesus today encourages disciples and us that although he's not with us physically, we would have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us to guide us, to give us wisdom, to make decisions. And this message provides us today with the functions. What is the function of the Holy Spirit? So follow along as I read the scripture today, starting in verse 5. But now I am going to him who sent me. None of you ask me, where are you going? Rather, you have been filled with grief because I said these things. But very truly I tell you, or it is true, it is true. It is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what yet is to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Now, Jesus' words at this point we're starting to sound like a jumble, a mess in the, the, the disciples' mind. They had pictured that Jesus would become king of Israel and that they would serve as his loyal lords within that kingdom. But all of a sudden, Jesus says, I'm going away. I'm out of here. And the disciples can't imagine what was going on. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. This puzzle is a large floor one, two foot by three foot that we have for our grandkids. It's of the solar system. They're very large pieces, and it's fairly easy, as adults at least, to put together. But something much more detailed was the disciples. Now, this puzzle has a thousand pieces in it. It's probably one of the most difficult puzzles that we as a family have tried to put together. I had very little input in that. I'm not that great at jigsaw puzzles, but Paula's really good. Her mom loved to do jigsaw puzzles. So over one of the holiday breaks, we did this with the family there, the kids there, and it took a long time to put it together. And it's like this detailed picture that the disciples said, well, this is what the kingdom of God was going to be like. And Jesus then said, well, I'm going away. And all of a sudden, their puzzle pieces went like this. And Jesus said, we're not missing pieces. Jesus says, you are to assemble the kingdom of God. It's up to you. But all they could see is this puzzle and all these pieces. 
And this picture that they had in their mind was now shattered. And they just didn't know how to deal with that. But Jesus says, and that's our lesson today, is to that the Holy Spirit will be with you to help you put this puzzle back together. After announcing this imminent departure from earth, he urged his followers, first of all, to obey his commands. And when you obey your command, you'll love one another. And then you'll be aware that there's going to be hostility and persecution in the world, and you need to prepare for that. Yes, your world might look like it's in pieces right now, but that's not the ultimate game. While offering these predictions and promises and commands, Jesus alluded to the coming Holy Spirit that would teach all believers everything that we would need to know in order to put that puzzle back together again. But these passing references could have only been more perplexing for the disciples. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was reserved for kings and prophets, and it only came upon people for a short period of time, and then it left. So they didn't grasp what this Holy Spirit would do. Once in a while, it would come on a regular person when the Lord wanted to accomplish something extraordinary in the Old Testament, but it never remained on them. The idea of the Spirit of God to indwell each of us on a permanent basis was unthinkable for the disciples. It was an unbelievable extravagance that they didn't feel they were worthy of. The disciples' head had to be spinning at that point in time. And all their disciples didn't ask about the Holy Spirit in this passage. They too were, were too preoccupied with the thoughts in their mind of Jesus going away. And their picture that they had in their mind was all of a sudden shattered into many pieces. Although the disciples didn't ask, the Lord brought this promise back to them to clarify the role of the Holy Spirit among the disciples and the lives of us as believers throughout all time since Jesus' day. So we look at verses 5 through 7. Jesus lamented that the disciples were so preoccupied with their own security that they were not the least bit concerned about Jesus' immediate future. Over the next two days, Jesus would be persecuted and whipped and hung on the cross to die. And yet all the disciples thought is, what happened to our kingdom? How am I going to play my role in this kingdom that was supposed to be set up by our rabbi? It was all about themselves, their plans that they had made about their future. The next few days would, so, would see some of the most momentous events in all of history, which would include inauguration of the Age of Grace, from the time where Christ rose from the the grave, and then was transcended into heaven, ascended into heaven, began the church age, the universal church, the age of grace. And it was the beginning of that worldwide spread of the gospel, because as of right now, the gospel was centered in Jerusalem. And Christ says, your world is much bigger than this. I'm not going to be the king of just the king of Israel. When I'm done... I'll be the king of the world. After this unspeakable suffering, Jesus would receive inexpressible glory. Naturally, he wanted to share this with his companions, his friends. Last week, he says, I call you friends. But now his friends, all they could think about is themselves. It'd be like a, a couple, a married couple, where the spouse was not interested in what the other spouse was doing at all. They were not unified. The disciples were only concerned about what's in it for them. Nevertheless, Jesus attended their sorrow-filled hearts. And the Greek term that was translated in verse 6 as grief means a deep, abiding pain that just goes to your core. And it could be either physical or emotional. And these pain-filled disciples' hearts, they felt like spiritual orphans. They said, Rabbi, how can you leave us alone? We've spent over three years with you, and now you're saying you're leaving? They couldn't think about how they would endure without Jesus there with them. But Jesus soothed their pain with a wonderful truth. The Lord's presence would be something replaced with something that's far superior. Jesus, when he is in the flesh, he can only be at one place at one time. The Holy Spirit can be everywhere at once. Dwelling within each one of us as we go our separate ways today, we'll carry that Holy Spirit with us to minister to the world. Limited by the presence of God in Jesus, when Jesus was on earth, 
To go to the Father, they had to go to Jesus. Now that Jesus ascended and we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, we can go boldly before God's throne. And Jesus is there standing with God and saying, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. Nothing that we do is, is co- not covered by the blood of Christ, that sacrifice that he had. Far from being abandoned, the disciples would experience the presence of God like they never knew before. And if you look at your bulletin insert on the side, it says the ministry of the Holy Spirit has a graphic where it says last words on it. Today we want to see the ministry of the Holy Spirit as the master, Jesus Christ, said it would be twofold. First of all, in verses 8 through 11, his ministry is to the world. And then we'll look at his ministry to the believers in verses 13 through 15. But let's look at 8 through 11 first, the Holy Spirit's ministry to the world. And the Greek word, verb translated prove to the world in the NIV or convict the world in the New Living Translation has a wide range of meanings. In the New Testament, it means to scorn, to bring into contempt, to rebuke. However, the New Testament writers restricted the definition as one, that he would prove the world to be wrong about sin. The world says, we have it figured out. Jesus Christ said, you're wrong about sin. The Holy Spirit confronts the world concerning three primary targets or topics. First of all, sin, the people's guilt. Righteousness, the people's helplessness. And judgment, the people's destiny. Of sin, we are all guilty of sin. For all have sinned and fallen short of God's precepts. As to righteousness, we are powerless to help ourselves. And consequently, our eternal destiny would be dreadful without divine help. So let's look at each of these three words here. Sin. In the Greek, the word is homatia. And it refers to one's inability or unwillingness to do as God command, resulting in guilt before him. Now, Jesus died for the penalty of sin for the whole world. But only those people who choose to believe are the ones who impute on them or appropriate the, that sacrifice on themselves. They stand guiltless before the Father. We stand before the Father's throne, and Christ will say, not guilty. But those who choose to reject Christ, they remain in their sin, and they answer for the choices that they have made. Next word is righteousness. The Greek word is dikaiosune, and it refers to one's legal standing before God as not guilty. In this context, Jesus relates the issue of righteousness, and righteousness, you keep in mind, means just right living. Jesus Christ was righteous because he lived right according to God's precepts. Righteousness to his going to the Father, because he lived right living righteousness, he could stand before God on our behalf. Throughout his ministry, Jesus claimed oneness with the Father, for which the world, the religious leaders in particular of his days, accused him of sin and deceit and blasphemy. They say you eat with your gluttonous and you eat with sinners, and they condemn them. His going to the Father was the ultimate vindication of Christ's righteousness over the world, and the Holy Spirit will confront humanity with the righteousness of the Son. And the third word is judgment, which in the Greek is krisis. And it refers to one's life and character as being sifted to determine one's moral worth. Now, Jesus repeatedly stated that he did not come to the world to judge the world. That was not his, his role. He was not to judge them. But individuals, you and I, and everyone in the world from day one would choose to be judged or not judged based on whether they accepted Christ or they don't accept Christ. Their response to the truth incarnate. The virtue of Christ's vindication. Satan, in this passage, it says, Satan has been sifted and is found wanting. He's condemned. He has no more sway over us. Therefore, the Holy Spirit will confront humanity concerning its choice of either Satan or the Son. And that's a choice of each one of us today. 
Interestingly, the confrontation of the Holy Spirit does not appear to be directly within the heart of non-believers. The Holy Spirit does not work in non-believers. Now, he may woo those who are without Christ so that they come to recognize Christ. But in this passage in particular, Jesus says, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove to the world to be wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. The context of these verses 8 through 11 is that the coming of the Holy Spirit will be to you as believers. In other words, the Holy Spirit will confront the world within believers and through believers. We are the instrument that the Holy Spirit works through. Those who are of the world do not have the Holy Spirit active in their lives because they have not made that choice yet. So it's up to us to display that Holy Spirit to others so that they might recognize their need of Christ. Now, as a child of God living on earth, empowered by the Holy Spirit, we're priority mail to them. We are a living letter of Jesus Christ. And as those who see us, they open our lives. And what should pour out of our lives is the fruit of the Spirit. In this way, they will know that we're Christians. One of those ways is by love. The first fruit of the Holy Spirit is love. They will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. So we are that priority mail to the world. As the world witnesses the child of God being controlled by the Spirit, showing the fruits of the Spirit in their lives, they will see that we are undergoing a transformation like a caterpillar transforms into a butterfly. We are in that metamorphosis of transforming from that caterpillar to a beautiful butterfly because of the Holy Spirit working in us. The Holy Spirit confronts the world through the activity and the actions of believers. So the question we need to ask each of our own, ourselves, are my actions displaying the, to the world that I am a believer, that the Holy Spirit is working through me? In verse 12, Jesus acknowledged the limitations of both the time and the ability for the disciples to receive more truth. They just could not comprehend any more truth that Jesus was trying to present to them. Their concern for themselves pre prevented them from absorbing more information concerning their mission for after Jesus' departure. Furthermore, that without the Holy Spirit, remember at this point, the Holy Spirit had not come to dwell within them. Their minds could not comprehend the spiritual truth that he, Jesus Christ, wanted to impart on them. Therefore, he promised further revelation of the truth after they were filled with the Holy Spirit. In the bottom half of that page on your bulletin and insert, the next section is the Holy Spirit's ministry to the believers in 13 through 15. One of the many distinctions between the world, remember Christ said, you are my own and I've taken you out of the world. So there was a distinction here. And it's how the Holy Spirit ministers. He ministers within his own, and we're to minister to the world. The ministry of the world convicts, is convicted and brought to repentance through our lives, the way we live. But on the other hand, the ministry of believers is to be obedient through transformation in our lives. The Spirit accomplishes his mission of the believer's transformation by bringing divine truths to our mind. And how can we have divine truths in our mind unless we meditate on God's word? And when we meditate on God's word, when we're in a point of crisis, then Jesus, the Holy Spirit, will bring to our mind those verses that we need to be strengthened. He revealed directly to certain people, such as kings and prophets in the Old Testament, and prophets and the apostles in the New Testament. But once John, that living apostle, completed his final written communication to God in the book of Revelation, humanity had received all the divine truth that it needed in order to live obediently. The Spirit's ministry is to call Scripture to mind that we've meditated on, to illumine its meaning in our minds, and to couple with our own personal life experiences that we apply it to our lives so that our lives represent Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit working in us. We participate in the Holy Spirit's transformation process by exercising spiritual disciplines. And those spiritual disciplines are like studying God's Word, meditating, prayer, worship, service to others, 
and evangelism or telling others of Christ? How were the disciples to know when the Holy Spirit was bringing them in this first century some new revelation? How were they to distinguish the thoughts of God from their own imaginations? According to Jesus, the revelation of the Holy Spirit will always glorify the Son. As we discovered when we studied chapter 13, the Greek word for glory was doxa, which derives the verb meaning to believe or to think. To glorif glorify, be glorified is to reveal in such a way as to be considered good. So when Jesus Christ was glorified, he was to be considered good because he was. He's the only one who lived completely righteous. To be glorified is to be vindicated in the eyes of all the witnesses. Therefore, the concept of glory in Jesus' vocabulary means that the truth he had been teaching and the truth of his identity would be vindicated in the eyes of all humanity. He promised the Holy Spirit would bring a new revelation consistent with what Jesus had already taught during that first century when the Bible was being formed, the New Testament was being formed. And the Spirit's ministry would always serve to prove the Son as genuine, the genuine Son of God. Therefore, if someone claims even today with some new revelation that they've been given by God, if any part of that revelation is contrary to God's precepts, then it's not part from the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus' promise of the Holy Spirit didn't do much to calm the troubled minds of those 11 disciples. All they saw was this jigsaw puzzle that was broken apart. They weren't sure how to put it together. The gift of the Holy Spirit would have been beyond their comprehension. And it's not really unlike us, though, but in reverse. We cannot fathom a life without Christ, a life without the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. But in order to even get a glimpse of that, we need to look at what the believers were, those disciples were, between that night that Jesus presented this word and Pentecost when they received the Holy Spirit. Their minds were dull and weak of spirit. They were fearful, confused, doubting, despondent, aimless, and passive. And at times we might say, well, I understand some of those characteristics in my own life. And it's not because the Holy Spirit isn't there, but as we dwell, as we're being transformed, they will become less and less in our lives. Consequently, Jesus instructed them to wait on the arrival of the Holy Spirit before attempting any type of ministry. As I read earlier in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, once he was, he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he has promised, as I told you before. And that gift was that gift of the Holy Spirit. When the Spirit of God filled the believers, everything started to change. The book of Acts describes the rise of the church as believers filled with the Holy Spirit began to change the world. And that little nucleus of believers that were there at Pentecost blossomed into over 3,000 when Peter preached. And from there, it has expanded throughout the world to billions of Christians in every tribe and every nation throughout the world. Started by that little nucleus of men and women filled by the Holy Spirit. So what's our application of this passage today? And that's on the other side of your bulletin insert. We thank God that he has not left us alone. And the application is that Christians are to be divine agents of change in the world. That's our responsibility. Jesus gave us the task of proclaiming the good news to a hostile world by sharing his love for the lost. It's an impossible mission for us without divine help, and that divine help is that Holy Spirit dwelling within us. Fortunately, he did not leave us alone because that Holy Spirit is within us to convict the world. He did not leave us alone. And I find two practical principles in this passage today to help us clarify so we might move more faithfully obey. The first practical principle is the convicting of the world. In the convicting of the world, the Spirit desires to use us as change agents, each one of us. The Spirit of God doesn't use buildings or pulpits or symbols to convict the world. And really, he doesn't even use nature or science or philosophy or even theology to convict the world. Scripture indicates conviction comes as when we, as citizens of God's kingdom, being filled with the Holy Spirit, testify to the world about him. And more importantly than testifying is what are our actions 
to others. That will testify of Jesus Christ, of the Holy Spirit working through us. According to Jesus, we will be convicted of sin. They will be convicted of sin when they see the evidence of the Spirit fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, and the remaining fruit of the Spirit. When others see that fruit in our lives, then they'll be convicted of their own sin in their lives. The Holy Spirit uses transformed Christians as a means of confronting the world. But that does not mean that God has appointed us to be the world's conscience. He has not called us out to point out people's sin and to take down names. You sinner, you sinner, you sinner. No. There are times where we need to stand against sin, the wrongdoing, and declare that it's contrary to God's word. However, we're not deputized into some sort of holy police force. In store, instead, he convicts the world of sin by sanctifying his own, we as believers, with the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. When people sin in groups of people, they cannot stand it when one of their own starts to do what is right. They either try to pull that person back into their group, into their sin, or they become hostile. If they fail to do that, they become hostile and start persecuting. And that's what we see in parts of the world, is that persecution, because we will not participate in the world's mindset. The second practical principle is in communicating the word, the Spirit desires to see changes in us that will cause changes in the world. It's a causation. If we change, then we have an opportunity to see the world change because of us. When the Spirit teaches, he expects people's lives to be transformed. He often uses unpleasant circumstances in our own lives to transform us from caterpillars into beautiful butterflies. And that causes tension in our lives. You see a caterpillar struggling to get out, to break out. And the worst thing you can do is to break open that cocoon and help that butterfly out because that will kill the butterfly. It's through that tension, through that agony, that the, ca the caterpillar turns into a butterfly. And sometimes we say, God, release me from the circumstances that's so trying. But God prefers to change us in that transforming of that caterpillar to a butterfly to see us because that struggle strengthens our wings well enough where we can then fly and take the message to others. The question is, have you ever been overcome with anguish that you felt so overwhelmed with sorrow, but utterly, completely, soul-sparingly alone? As if no one on earth could possibly understand the depths of your pain. And I think most of us have gone through at least some level of that. At times like these, it helps us to remember that God is there, that he's ready to shoulder our burdens, our suffering, and our distress. Not only does God understand you and see you in the center of your pain, but he's available to us, listening, waiting for us to cry out for his help, cry out in our heartache, our anger, and our sadness. And it reminds me of Psalms of Lament. Now, some of the, the psalms that were written were classified as lament songs. That means they were full of sorrow, which they typically begin with the psalmist on his face, begging God to be relieved from the agony that they're going through. Everything is broken. Their lives have fallen apart. They're surrounded by affliction, and they've run out of options. Yet amazingly, by the end of the psalm, that lamenting psalmist turns everything back to God's goodness. Everything, nothing changed with the psalmists themselves. Everything changed with the relationship with God because they turned to God for the strength. Psalm chapter 130 is one of those psalms, so let me read that to you. A song of the, for the pilgrims ascending to Jerusalem. From the depths of despair, O Lord, I call for your help. Hear my cry, O Lord. Pay attention to my prayer. Lord, if you kept a record of our sins, who, O Lord, could ever survive? But you offer forgiveness that we might learn to fear you. I am counting on the Lord. Yes, I am counting on him. I have put my hope in his word. I long for the Lord. More than centuries long for the dawn. Yes, more than centuries long for the dawn. 
O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with with the Lord there is unfailing love. His redemption overflows. He himself will redeem Israel from every kind of sin. Now, Chuck Swindoll, who was a pastor all of his adult life and was the president of the Dallas Theological Seminary for a while, he has a story to help us illustrate this. It says, many years ago, I received a letter from a church member who had endured the worst year imaginable. His wife left him and took his two children with her. Challenges in his business brought pressure that he had never known before. He was quickly running out of options. In his letter, he admitted, with with enemies all around, I suddenly discovered through the information I got from God's word and through the leading of his Holy Spirit that I could love those who hate me, that I didn't have to live this life with the acid resentment eating away from me from within. I learned that I could pray for my wife and love her just as much as I loved the little ones that she had taken from me. And he concluded by saying, These have been the hardest circumstances I have ever known, but I am transformed. Praise God. This man became an agent of change in his sector of the world by allowing the word of the Spirit to change him from within. And that's what the Spirit does. The work of the Holy Spirit within us and through us will impact our world. You might say, well, I don't have any ministry or much of a ministry. Yes, you do. Everyone you come in contact with, you are a minister to them. No less different than being up here and speaking at church. Probably more effective, more impactful to your world and how important it is for you to live that. We are transformed, and as we are transformed, we become channels of God's transformation to the world. As we are changed, we become divine change agents in the world. And that's represented by that fruit of the Spirit we talked about last week. And that fruit of the Spirit, that Spirit changing, transforming us, takes these broken pieces of our lives and puts us into a beautiful picture of what a Christian should be, of what someone living for the Lord can be an ancient of change. And someone could, that might have known of our broken life in the past will then see the beautiful picture that our life now represents and say, they've been transformed. I want that transformation. I'm going to choose Christ, the Son, over Satan. And that's the passage of, that Jesus was teaching on for us today. And the next Sunday, Jesus provides us with three key words to keep us going during these troubled times. So please read John chapter 16, verses 16 through 33 in preparation for that message. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you. We lift your name on high. We thank you for your blessings, for the Holy Spirit that's transforming our lives from lowly caterpillars into beautiful butterflies, taking our lives is a jumbled piece of a jigsaw puzzle and making it into a beautiful picture that shows Jesus Christ through our lives. We thank you that the Holy Spirit is alive and active and working in our hearts on a daily basis. Help us to be part of that transformation process by being moldable, malleable into the person that you want us to be, Father. Give us the strength to carry on each day. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I pray that this message was a blessing and a time of learning from God's Word. Thank you so much for allowing me to be your guide, your mentor, but most importantly, I am your friend, as I serve you through the Wisdom Trek podcast and journal each day. And as we take this trek of life together, let us always live abundantly. Love unconditionally, listen intentionally, learn continuously, lend to others generously, lead with integrity, and leave a living legacy each day. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, reminding you to keep moving forward, enjoy your journey, and create a great day every day. See you next time for more wisdom from God's Word.